The Graveyard of Empires is a nickname often given to Afghanistan for its tendency to cripple or destroy foreign powers meddling in their country. This is especially true when it comes to the Soviet-Afghan War of the late 1970s to 1980s. In this video, I aim to describe the brutality of the war, why it was fought in the first place, and the aftermath of the conflict. My name is Michael, and I hope you enjoy the video. Before I begin, it's important to note that Imperial Russia, and later the USSR, had interest in the region even before the war. The USSR's involvement in the region is outside the scope of this video, but I will say the Soviets had some level of involvement in Afghanistan since its independence from Britain in 1919. That being said, let's get right into it. The first president of Afghanistan, Mohammad Dawood Khan, came to power after overthrowing his cousin and brother-in-law, Muhammad Zir Shah on July 17, 1973. Once in office, Dawood was proven to be unpopular with the general population, especially the Islamists who saw, da who saw Dawood's left-wing ministers as a threat. President Dawood was also incredibly repressive and limited civil liberties, making people dislike him even more. After the death of PDPA leader Mir Akbar Khyber, on April 17, 1978, the PDPA opposition grew exponentially. Dawood's government was already starting to distance themselves from the communists, brutally, brutally repressing groups like the PDPA, but the death of one of their key members was the last straw. On April 27th and 28th, 1978, the PDPA, mostly headed by the Kalk faction, launched an armed coup against the first president of Afghanistan. After horrific fighting, the communists won, killing Dawood and 18 members of his family. But this wasn't the end of the conflict, just the start of it. The PDPA was fragmented, split between the Kalk faction, or the masses, and the Parcham faction, or the flag faction. In the aftermath of the Saar revolution, Nur Muhammad Taraki came out on top and became president. Taraki and his lieutenant, Amin, headed the Kalk faction, while the smaller Parcham faction was led by Karmal. Karmal is a surprise tool that'll help us out later. Taraki was deeply unpopular, like his predecessor. In the name of progress, he alienated Muslim and tribal leaders, while also suppressing the small urban class. He attempted to implement social and land reforms, such as, such as changing marriage laws to give women more autonomy and land reforms, but this only exacerbated his downfall. In order to consolidate power, Taraki launched a merciless purge against all opposition, which included the Parcham faction. An insurgency within the country was starting to slowly take root, in part supported and funded by Pakistan and the U.S. This all came to a head in mid-1978 when a rebellion was sparked and soon grew to encompass the entire country. A year later, as soon as it started, it all fell apart. On September 14, 1979, after months of their relationship deteriorating, Amin, along with some government officials, were shot at by Taraki's bodyguards when entering the presidential palace. In response, and as a show of his power, Amin put the army on high alert and sent the 4th Armored Corps to take up positions around the palace. After the whole event, Amin went to the Soviets to ask what to do. The president at the time, Brezhnev, basically said, do whatever you want. So, on October 8, 1979, Amin had his arch-rival killed by suffocation. The media reported his death as a serious illness, not a murder. Amin's ascent to power was seen as a threat to the USSR since he later entered talks with the US. The Soviets, for obvious reasons, didn't want a US-friendly country on its borders. Even though Amin was essentially given the go-ahead to kill Taraki, his death shocked the Soviets and even contributed to their decision to evade the graveyard of empires. The Mujahideen, which translates to those who engage in jihad, emerged before the Soviets invaded. The term Mujahideen was a general term for the various different groups that fought against the Soviets, the majority of which were Pashtun. A good chunk of their forces came from Muslims from outside of Afghanistan, dubbed Afghan Arabs. Initially, the Mujahideen rose up in response to the brutal overthrow of the Shah and the repressive communist government that followed. At first, the Mujahideen were poorly equipped, using pack animals as transportation. However, they had one thing the Soviets didn't a knowledge of the terrain and country. Their primary tactic was guerrilla warfare, a type of unconventional warfare that the Soviet military was not equipped to fight effectively. 
The weapons and equipment the Mujahideen used steadily improved and modernized as the U.S. and some of its allies funneled the freedom fighters' weapons and funds. The invasion of Afghanistan was a surprise to the Western world, especially the U.S. However, the U.S. was prepared. Operation Cyclone commenced in December of 1979, the same month as the USSR invaded Afghanistan. Operation Cyclone aimed to better arm the Mujahideen through the U.S.'s ally, Pakistan, who has and had a large population of Pashtuns. At the beginning of the conflict, the U.S. spent between 20 and $30 million a year supporting the Mujahideen, which later increased to $630 million per year in 1987. That's roughly $75 million and $112 million during the early stages of the war, and over $2.3 billion in 2023 U.S. dollars. Pakistan, although it was a dictatorship at the time, was important to the U.S.'s strategy of containment. Muhammad Zia-ul-Haq's regime, although authoritarian, was seen as a key ally in the fight against communism. So, the U.S., doing what the U.S. does best, helped fund Pakistan's military buildup giving them F-16As and Bs. As a result, Pakistan agreed to help the U.S. arm and fund the Mujahideen, allowing the movement of supplies and equipment through their border with Afghanistan. Obviously, the Soviets and their Afghan puppet government caught on to this, sending fighter jets and bombers to destroy refugee camps and disrupt the tidal wave of supplies heading to the freedom fighters. Pakistan was largely relegated to air support, destroying communist aircraft that entered its airspace, but later went on a limited air offensive, destroying some Soviet transport and fighter aircraft inside of Afghanistan. The U.S. and its allies, most notably the U.K., sent a variety of supplies to the Mujahideen, including communication equipment, mortars, and most notably the FIM-92 Stinger. This legendary shoulder-fired anti-aircraft launcher turned the tide of the war in favor of the Mujahideen. The Stinger, in the 80s, costed roughly $38,000 to produce, hardly even a fraction of the expensive Soviet helicopters and planes. This made the war even more costly for the Soviets. Soviet troops were in Afghanistan long before the war even started. But in 1979, after protests and violence erupted in the country, the Soviets finally agreed to send in their armed forces. On June 16th, the Soviets sent in detachments of tanks and armored vehicles to protect the government and secure two key air bases outside of Kabul, the Bagram and Shindan air bases. In addition to this, an airborne battalion led by Colonel Lamakin arrived in Bagram on July 7th. However, they arrived disguised as technicians, not in uniform and combat gear. The Afghan government continued to request military personnel, however, the Soviets were hesitant to send in more units. After months of deliberation and sabotage, it was finally decided to invade. On December 25th, under the pretext of delivering humanitarian aid, the 40th Army entered Afghanistan. Two days later, troops arrived in Kabul's airport, securing it. On that same day, 700 Soviet Special Forces and KGB soldiers dressed in plain clothes occupied critical pieces of infrastructure such as government and military buildings. In addition to this, they occupied the Tajbeg Palace, where a man and his government moved into in order to be safe from the violence that was unfolding. Ironically, a man and his government were in contact with the 40th Army and even planned out the routes for them to take. They were completely oblivious to what was actually going on, though. At 1915, local time, the assault on the palace commenced, resulting in the death of a man. The initial operation was declared a success on December 28th. In addition to the 40th Army, which was under command of Marshal Sergei Sokolov, the 103rd Guards Airborne Division also entered Afghanistan on December 27th via the aforementioned Bagram Air Base. The 201st and 68th Motor Rifle Divisions also entered the country around the same time. Overall, the Soviets had 100,000 soldiers on the ground as well as 1,800 tanks and 2,000 IFVs. The Afghan civilians didn't take too kindly, obviously, to a foreign entity blatantly invading their country and overthrowing their government whether it was popular or not. Tensions in the capital boiled over during the Three Hoot Uprising that took place on February 22, 1980. The protest was triggered due to the mass arrest of civilians and the Soviet invasion. As a result, over 600 protesters were murdered. Only two months later, in April and May 1980, Soviet protests became a common occurrence in Kabul, 
ultimately resulting in several war crimes that were perpetrated by the Soviets and PDPA government. Another example of Afghans protesting the Soviet invasion was in late December 1979 to February 1980 in the famous city of Kandahar. The citizens of Kandahar rose up against the Soviet garrison, killing several of them, ultimately forcing the garrison out of the city. In addition to this, assassinations of Soviet soldiers in broad daylight were also extremely common, forcing the Soviets to stop patrolling the seats of Kabul in January 1981. Several members of the ruling Karmal government were also assassinated during this time. The Soviets held major pieces of infrastructure, such as government buildings, military bases, and highways, but they were unable to pacify the countryside where the Mujahideen controlled and operated from. In total, the Soviets and their puppet government controlled roughly 20% of the country. For the next nine years, the Soviets and their allies would be locked in a brutal anti-guerrilla war. Every time the Soviets engaged the Mujahideen, they would disappear into the countryside, ambushing Soviet columns and besieging isolated cities and garrisons. Unsurprisingly, as we've seen in modern case studies with Afghanistan, it is incredibly costly to deal with an asymmetrical insurgency, especially when they have modern weapons. Interestingly, something that I haven't heard of before doing research for this video, the CIA themselves actually encouraged the Mujahideen to attack into the USSR. In one out of three instances of this happening, a group of Afghans attacked a factory 10 miles deep into Uzbekistan. That doesn't seem very far, but considering that they mostly rode on pack animals, this is pretty impressive. As a result, the Soviets threatened to invade Pakistan, who were aiding the insurgents, but this ultimately didn't happen. After years of fighting, it was finally time to leave Afghanistan. In 1985, the Soviets began to plot their exit. Before leaving, though, the Soviets attempted to aid the Afghan army, giving them material support and training them to fight the growing insurgency. The Afghan army, however, like their Soviet counterparts, was ripe with corruption, desertion, and was overall not in a good place to take on such a large responsibility. The Karmal government lost the May 1986 election to Mohammad Jibola, a little-known political figure who was actually the former head of the KHAD, the Afghan secret police. He ultimately turned the situation around, instituting reforms and consolidating power. But this was a little too late. The Soviets had to leave Afghanistan, and fast. Coupled with international and internal pressure, the Soviets had to leave Afghanistan. In April 1988, the 1988 Geneva Accords were signed. The Accords discussed a lot of things, but for the purpose of this video, it set a timetable for the Soviet withdrawal. They announced their withdrawal in 1987 with the final military operation, Operation Magistral, taking place on November 19, 1987, and lasted until January 10, 1988. This operation really didn't do too much in the grand scheme of the war, however it was a symbolic victory for the Soviets who could say that they left with the final victory. Soviet forces began to withdraw in May 1988, with the last troops leaving the country on February 15, 1989, finally ending the Soviet-Afghan War. Unsurprisingly, war crimes were a common occurrence during the war. Some scholars argue that the Soviets and their communist allies in Afghanistan were even guilty of committing genocide. I won't be arguing whether a genocide did or didn't take place, however I will be going over examples of brutal war crimes that did take place. However, this is not a comprehensive list and a lot of other things did happen. Just a general trigger real quick, um, topics such as rape, obviously war crimes, uh, and mass murder are mentioned. Um, so if you don't want to hear about this, which is completely understandable, uh, please skip to the next timestamp where I go over the aftermath of the war. One brutal example of repression of any dissent was in March and April 1980 when, on two occasions, schoolgirls in Kabul were shot and arrested for protesting the Karmal regime and the Soviet invasion. This happened again in September 1981. A quote from an unnamed official describes the brutal scene. It was coming from inside a tank like a tape through a loudspeaker, announcing, Stop the demonstration. Don't go ahead. Go back to your classes. Otherwise, you'll be shot. There was a small speech like, you are the property of the country, and young girls don't know that this is the hand of imperialism, and imperialism is never happy for you to have a happy life. And you shouldn't be fooled to listen to imperialism, and Russians are here to help us, and Russians are here to support revolution, and stuff like that. The girls continued shouting, we know you Russians, we know you sons of Lenin, we know you are murderers, 
and we don't want to go back. We'd rather prefer to be killed than to go back to our classes. We want you Russians out of Afghanistan. That's what they were shouting. Then they were firing from the Russian tanks. Six girls were killed. The Afghan secret police, known as the KHAD, was styled after the Soviet KGB and was notorious for torturing prisoners. An example of this is the extrajudicial killings of nine Afghans who were allegedly involved in the 1986 bombing of the Kabul airport. The trial was less than fair, to put it likely, and little evidence was presented. There was even a unit akin to the Imperial Japanese 731, known as the 105 Administration. They were a professional torturer unit who had a variety of different torturing methods, from taking nails off of hands, to beatings, to electrocutions. The accounts of torture I read were too detailed and too horrific for YouTube, but if you want to read more about it, I recommend reading the 2005 Afghanistan Justice Project, which is linked below. Mass and indiscriminate murder of civilians was also an unfortunately common occurrence. In April 1982, in the town of Kolm, roughly 200 civilians were murdered because three Russian soldiers were killed in the region. The Soviet army mostly targeted mosques, wedding events, and really any event that had a lot of people at it. Rape was also common, especially amongst young girls from the countryside. They were often deducted in helicopters and taken away from their homes. The KHAD was also complicit in this. Reports from deserted Russian soldiers told of horrific events where KHAD and Soviet personnel abducted and raped young women and civilians in Kabul. Finally, if it wasn't enough, there were also reports of chemical weapons being used against civilians. Soviet losses in Afghanistan numbered between 14,000 and 26,000, with tens of thousands more wounded. The material losses were also staggering, with a total of 451 aircraft, including 333 helicopters, being shot down, along with 147 tanks, 1,314 armored vehicles, and 11,369 various other vehicles. The Mujahideen suffered immense losses as well, estimated to, to be between 75,000 and 90,000 killed. The greatest losses, though, came from the civilians. Between 562,000 and 2 million Afghan civilians were killed throughout the war, with a further 5.5 to 6.2 million fleeing to Iran and neighboring Pakistan. Analysts such as R.J. Rummel estimated that the Soviets were responsible for 250,000 intentional killings of civilians, while their communist puppet government was responsible for 178,000 civilian deaths. It could be argued that the Soviet invasion created the terrorist culture that is seen in the 21st century. Groups such as the Taliban who came from the Mujahideen might not even have existed if it weren't for the invasion. In addition to this, the war is often attributed to contributing to the downfall of the USSR. The Red Army was also seen as invincible, the protectors of communism, and the glue that held the Union and Warsaw Pact together. The Soviet-Afghan war showed not only the world, but the Soviet citizens themselves that their beloved army wasn't as godly as they were made out to be, ultimately contributing to the already fracturing society. In addition to this, the war created a massive power vacuum in the country, creating the perfect atmosphere for extremism and violence that is still seen to this day. The Soviet-Afghan war, like all wars for the most part, has seeped into pop culture. Countless books ranging from the CIA's involvement in the war to fictional stories about hunting down spies have been written. The same is true for movies, with critically acclaimed movies such as Rambo 3 and The Living Daylights being set during the Soviet invasion. Even video games reference the war, with games such as Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain being set in Afghanistan, and Call of Duty Black Ops 2 making references to the war. In Russia and the USSR, the field invasion has seen a lot of attention, with songs like Hello Sister, Don't Tell Mom I'm in Afghanistan, which is the song that's been playing through the section, in movies such as the Soviet, All Costs Paid, and the Russian movie, Leaving Afghanistan, talking about the war. I won't be surprised if more video games, movies, songs, and books are made on this topic. Personally, Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe so more people can learn about military history. If you want to support what I do, please check out my Patreon page and eBay for some cool perks and products. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.